Welcome to the People of AI podcast, showcasing inspiring people with interesting stories in the field of artificial intelligence. I'm Ashley Oldacre. Let's jump right in. This podcast is sponsored by Google. Any remarks made by the speakers are their own and are not endorsed by Google. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm joined by my wonderful co-host, Gus. Gus, I'm super excited because we have a wonderful guest today. Hi, everyone. Glad to be here. I'm delighted and honored to welcome a legend in the field, François Chalet. To start off, we'll read François's bio. François is a software engineer and artificial intelligence researcher at Google. He is the creator of the Keras Deep Learning Library, released in 2015. His research focuses on computer vision, the application of machine learning to formal reasoning, abstraction, and how to achieve greater generality in artificial intelligence. His interests lie in understanding the nature of abstraction and developing algorithms capable of autonomous abstraction, democratizing the development and deployment of AI technology by making it easier to use and explaining it clearly, and leveraging technology, in particular AI, to help people gain greater agency over their circumstances and reach their full potential. He has published the popular deep learning textbook, Deep Learning with Python, which has been translated into 13 languages. Welcome, Francois. Thank you for taking the time. You are a very prominent figure in the space of artificial intelligence. And so to get things going, we would love to know where your interest in tech and in computer science and artificial intelligence started. Uh, well, I was, you know, I was fascinated with computers uh, since like before I before I had one. I was actually, you know, pressing my pants for, uh, to, to to get one. Uh, How come? What was fascinating about it? I'm not sure, but yeah, as as a as a kid, uh, I, I just I just love computers. They were they were just you know fascinating to me. I I can't really explain why, like what what I was seeing in them, but you know, it's just a thing. Just how it was. So, okay, so you pressed your parents for the computer and you finally got one. Yeah. And what was the first thing you did with it other than... Playing video games, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, that's, the, that's the more important thing. Uh, no, but um, I guess the, the, the next thing I did uh, was uh, I, I took up digital painting, right? So I got uh, a pen tablet, like an early like Wacom pen tablet, uh, and started painting. And I, I, got, I got, I think, pretty, pretty good at it for a teenager at least. What did you paint? Uh, at first, mostly video game fan art because, you know, I was really into <laughs> video games. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. And you sort of started on the sort of journey of computer science and playing with computers. And so did that translate a lot in school as well? Or was that sort of your passion and interest in computers kind of was a sort of a hobby on the side? Or did that also come from school? Definitely did not come from school. So honestly... Uh, I I don't feel like I got much from school, uh, uh, from from like you know middle school in particular. Uh, it was not it was not a great experience for me to be honest. Uh, but yeah, um, I, I I'm not sure where where my interest in tech really comes from to be honest. One thing I know is uh, about age like 15, 16, uh, I decided that um, what I needed to do with my life was invent intel- uh, artificial intelligence, invent AI, true AI and use it to make robots. And I'm not entirely sure where that idea came from. It probably, it was probably the influence uh, of Asimov, like the, the robot uh, uh, book series. That's probably at least part uh, of where this came from, but I don't remember the specifics. I do remember that I had this idea and it became my thing, right? And um, the, the first thing I started doing when uh, I started focusing on this idea uh, so back then, you know, I, I had no programming experience, right? Uh, I was, in fact, not not very familiar with you know tech in general because uh, uh, I was I was mostly into into reading, drawing, writing. I was I was actually not doing that well at at, at uh, subjects like math, uh, for instance. So the first thing I did is uh, I started listening to uh, neuropsychology lectures online. So this was like. 2005, 2006, it was the very beginning of the uh, MIT OpenCourseWare program, which is like this, uh, uh, it's about, uh, uh, you know, recording uh, MIT lectures and open sourcing them, basically putting them uh, online, freely available. And so I started uh, uh, listening to these uh, Neuropsychology 101 uh, lectures from MIT. And, um, well, it was, it was very interesting, actually. Um, so my, my, 
basically my my naive assumption is well you know we probably know a lot about how brain uh, how brains work right uh, we we probably know uh, enough uh, uh, to use that knowledge to to start implementing uh, uh, AI and well the lectures were were super interesting but uh, at the same time you know it, it, it quickly became clear that we we sure know a lot about brains uh, but what we have is this big collection of observations and what's missing is an actual model of the brain like an explanation uh, with regard to how the brain implements thinking uh, our, our reasoning our, our memory our perception and so that was that was kind of disappointing so I, I i came away from this experience you know thinking that yeah you like neuropsychology is, is cool and interesting but it's it's also kind of kind of useless when it comes to to implementing ai um so and it was useless because what you wanted was sort of a model of the brain yeah an explanation ex exactly right, right. an explanation rather than just you know a collection of uh, anecdotes and observations uh but the the, the lectures were, were great like it's it's uh, the, the the lecture i don't i don't actually remember who the, the lecturer was but uh, very interesting very good um, yeah, so after that, you know, uh, uh, I was like uh, 17, 18. So uh, I, got, I got busy with math and physics. Uh, I went to uh, something called a class preparatoire, which is like a two year, uh, very intensive uh, math and physics uh, uh, program. Uh, so I did by that. By choice? By choice, yeah, absolutely by choice. Because uh, I wanted to do science, you know, obviously, you know, I was, mm -hmm. I was interested in, in AI, so I wanted to do science. And this was basically the only path available for me at the time. Because right, you um, said like you didn't you weren't doing well in, in middle school and so in middle school, yes, yeah, originally. Sort of, it's not because I couldn't, it's really just because the the, the teachers uh, sucked and, and the environment <laughs> sucked. Okay. Uh, so okay. I by, by by my final year of high school I was I was getting top grades uh, in, in everything. Uh, so yeah, so I went to uh, a, a class preparatoire. I, I actually enjoyed it. It was it was an interesting time. Uh, so but that was I was extremely busy. Uh, with with my studies, uh, then I joined an engineering school, and I picked uh, that engineering school because it had uh, a pretty good uh, robotics uh, department. Uh, so uh, I, I I joined when I was uh, just turning twenty, and from that point uh, I started reading a lot of AI research papers. Also at that time uh, I read um, the book uh, On Intelligence by Jeff Hawkins, which I really loved. It was like one uh, one of the sort of like milestones. Uh, on the, on the, on my path, um, so very very interesting, very inspiring book, um, and um, yeah, another researcher that uh, uh, caught my attention uh, at the time. So when I was twenty, was uh, uh, French researcher Pierre Voudeyer, who was uh, an early pioneer of research uh, on artificial curiosity, uh, interesting motivation, and so on. Uh, so very very interesting stuff. So I was really into into that sort of topic. So. One, one of the first books uh, I bought was uh, Artificial Intelligence and Modern Approach uh, by, by Russell and Novig. And well, it's, that was very much algorithms. It was like very, this was very much applied engineering type of thing uh, with, with no, no, uh, uh, no power to explain anything about thinking itself. So that part was also kind of disappointing for me. Like I went from learning about neuroscience and being disappointed to learning about what, what what was AI at the time and being very disappointed in it. But what I found uh, to be really cool and interesting back then at, at, at the time was uh, a, a tiny subfield uh, of robotics called uh, cognitive developmental robotics. And what was really interesting about it is that it was all about uh, building uh, uh, models uh, of how the how young children basically develop cognition, how they, how they learn, how they learn to learn and so on, and trying out these models uh, in robots. So why, why robots? Why not simulations, for instance? Uh, it's really because uh, one, one of the core ideas of cognitive development robotics was that uh, cognition was embodied. Like you need, you need a body in order to start thinking. And this is, this is something I truly believed as well. Um, so uh, when, I, when I left uh, my engineering school, I actually started uh, doing research uh, at a lab that was, that was, uh, that was strong. Uh, in that area, which was at the University of Tokyo. So I moved to Tokyo, started doing research, um, and, and I, I really enjoyed it, actually. That's an incredible journey um, and quite a unique one. The question I want to ask is, there's a fascination with understanding the brain and by default, adding some kind of 
value judgment to the fact that our brain is very, very superior and wanting to then understand it, but then also wanting to replicate it. And my understanding of AI is kind of, it's wanting to replicate that intelligence in machines. Would you agree? I guess, yeah, at, at a very high level, that's a dream of the field. In right. practice, if you look at what people doing AI actually do, very, very few people are working on models of general intelligence, of models of the brain. It's, it's an extremely niche uh, research topic. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the past, you know, before the rise of machine learning, most people were doing uh, algorithms. They were doing like search, planning, uh, A star, and so on, uh, which has actually nothing to do with the brain. Right. Uh, and then later on, you know, uh, 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 machine learning became a big thing. So people started doing things like random forests or, or, or gradient boosted trees, which again, uh, uh, decision trees have nothing to do with the brain. And then people started just um, fitting curves uh, because it turned out to be a, a really powerful way uh, uh, to, to learn stuff. So people started training deep learning models, which are basically these very uh, high dimensional uh, uh, parametric curves. Um, and um, again, that's, that's not quite how the brain works. You could say that's how maybe a subset uh, of the brain works. That's like the, the perception uh, subsystem. If you, if you tell me, you know, hey, uh, perception in the brain uh, is probably implemented with some uh, rough biological equivalent of gradient descent, I think that's plausible. Uh, but that's just perception. Most learning in the brain uh, that, uh, is not is not gradient descent. Is not is not curve feeding. Um, so I really think you know very very few people are actually trying to even ask the question: What is intelligence, uh, mm. and what what would be a good model for it, or, or even a good a good definition for it? Uh, yeah, most people most people like when people say, for instance, they they're working on AGI. Typically, what they mean is that they're working on scaling up LLMs. Uh, LLMs are definitely not a model of the brain. Right, large uh, language models. Yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. My understanding is sort of to reproduce this concept of intelligence, but you're right, in practice, it's taken, it's evolved in like in a very, very different different way, and the outcomes have also been very different. Um, and so just coming back to your story, was that what was driving you to go into the field, this concept of wanting to mimic intelligence in sort of machines? Absolutely, yeah. The very first question I started asking was actually not so much how can I recreate intelligence, but just I, I just wanted to better understand uh, uh, intelligence in, in humans. Like, how do I think? Uh, why am I conscious? How does how does any of this work? Mm -hmm. Right. I, I do believe that trying to model it, recreate it, so not just like come up with a theoretical model, but come up with an algorithm and implement it and try to run it in practice, is is basically the the only practical way uh, of making progress. I think if you, if you're just, if you just like sit down, uh, read papers and think very hard about AI, which is basically what I was doing at like uh, be between like 15 and 20, uh, you're not, you're not going to get very far. Like at, at 20, I actually came up with my first like model of, of general intelligence. And I, I think it was, it was pretty, pretty clever. It got, it got a lot of things directionally right. But because it was, it was still at this stage um, where you just think about things and, and write them down it was very much ineffective, you know? Like in order to make progress, you really need to come up with something that's algorithm level. You need to, you need to implement it. AI is very much uh, applied engineering. And to mm -hmm. make progress in AI, you need to get into that feedback loop where you can implement something, run an experiment, see the results, and, and use that to inform the, the next iteration. So does working in sort of the field of machine learning help you understand the brain. And then there's sort of this feedback loop of like, the more you understand about the brain, the more you can feed it into sort of artificial intelligence. And then the more you learn about artificial intelligence, it teaches us about sort of our own learning. Because the underlying question to that is like, if you were so interested in the brain, why not go in the direction? Like why, why not go into neuroscience? Exactly. Right, yeah. Well, I thought about it. But ultimately, you know, as, as, as I told you, I found, I found neuropsychology to not be a practically effective way to understand the brain. And I, I, still, I still believe so today. I believe that um, uh, uh, a, a true, like plausible model of cognition is not gonna come from neuropsychology. And the reason why is just because to understand something, it's not enough to observe it, to collect you know, observations, even very granular observations about it. In order to, to understand anything, you need to start from a model of it. So for instance, deep learning emerged very much um, 
because uh, it, it was getting good results on on perception problems, right? Mm -hmm. That's 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 how it got started. Uh, that's that's where the, the first successes Which means were. Perception means what? Perception. So, for instance, image classification. Uh, you, you have a bunch of images, you you, and some of them are dark, some of them are cats. You want to know which ones which ones are dark, which ones, which ones are cats. And as as it turns out, um, the sort of system you end up with. Uh, was able uh, to inform models of the visual cortex. And it's, it's a little bit full cycle, actually, because the earliest uh, uh, machine learning models that try to solve the, uh, the, the, the perception problem, so for instance, the deep learning architecture that was very successful in, in that particular problem was uh, the Convnet architecture, which actually derives from, well, multiple things, but uh, for instance, uh, from uh, so, uh, deep Convnets, uh, uh, are partly inspired by the uh, HMAX model of the visual cortex, which was just from like the, the 2000s. And before that, there was there was the, the neocognitron. Well, these are actually inspired by, by the visual cortex, right? So the, uh, the, our study of the visual cortex kind of uh, helped us uh, come up with this sort of like practical algorithm for solving perception problems. And that model in turn uh, helps us understand how the visual cortex actually works. Oh, wow. Okay. So it does go back to this concept of the visual cortex informed how to sort of build these models. Uh, that yeah, then, at, at first. And at first. Not, not, not really in the sense that, so it's it's sort of counterintuitive. You might think it's like, hey, we, we started by understanding the visual cortex. Then right. we use that understanding to create a model of it, which turned out to be really powerful for classifying images. Right. It's actually not really that. We started with like loose observations about the structure of the visual cortex. Um, we use that as inspiration to come up with techniques that were largely not grounded in the visual cortex, that were very much you know, independent. We are very much guided by what is working out in practice on that image classification problem. Uh, and and uh, that algorithm eventually uh, uh, can, can be able to, to inform neuropsychology research. Ah, oh, so many things are making sense. Thank you very much for that explanation. When I come back to sort of this, this, the original question of, you know, why not go into, you know, neuroscience? Why sort of go into machine learning? Instead of studying the sort of the theory and the observations, it's like you're building and studying a brain kind of at the same time. So you're That's sort right. of, you're feeding information from like the way that our brain is shaped to sort of inspire. But I think what it sounds to me like is the joy that you have is sort of being able to build and tweak and change and really sort of get your hands on like a brain in a sense and see the outcomes of it. As That's opposed right. To, yeah. uh, and, and, and fundamentally, that, so to, to start with, I think it's just more fun to actually invent something, implement <laughs> it and try to run it in practice compared to just like observing. Uh, right. biological system. You can't really cut open a person's brain either. And yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I also really believe this is how you make um, faster progress, right? Because because uh, you can get to this very fast feedback loop where you get an idea, uh, uh, implement it in practice, test it, uh, uh, collect collect the data about your idea, and then use that to, to inform the next idea. Makes a lot of sense. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. So uh, we sort of took a bit of a detour. So last time we left on your journey, you were in Japan studying a PhD program. Yeah. Um, so what was that about? So, yeah. So I was, I was doing uh, cognitive developmental uh, robotics, and uh, I was particularly uh, interested in uh, unsupervised uh, video data uh, processing. So you get like a video feed. Uh, and you want to be able to uh, segment it into scenes or situations. Uh, you want to be able to build uh, a perceptual model of what's going on in the scene and so on. So it was technically uh, doing deep learning, but not deep learning with current descent. Uh, it's, it's actually something that people may not necessarily realize, but you can do deep learning without current descent, uh, just like layer-wise. And yeah, so what I was uh, doing was basically building a modular hierarchical uh, representations um, uh, of a video feed in a completely unsupervised way. Uh, and uh, that was based on metrics factorization uh, rather than grand descent, which you know works works well enough for shallow networks. Um, and uh, I, I was able to to use that to to perform basically a um, few shot uh, video segmentation. So the segmentation part worked actually really well, uh, and a few shot uh, classification or clustering. 
So basically, it's like, hey, if you see like uh, uh, a specific hand gesture, then you see different hand gesture, and then you see the same, the, the first hand gesture again, you can tell it's the same one as the first one. So you, 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 you're simultaneously able to, to tell where the gesture ends and uh, begins and ends, and you can you can cluster them basically. So that that was that was uh, what uh, what the research was about. So that was fun, but then you know I, I needed to actually make money. So I went uh, I- into the, the tech industry. I did a couple of startups. Wait, wait. Uh, you so you founded startups? No, I joined. You joined. Uh, okay. Joined a startup. Okay. Uh, and then I joined another startup. Uh, and uh, uh, but I, I was so. Uh, so I, I moved to first uh, New York City, then uh, San Francisco, and uh, I was I was you know very much trying to do my own startup for like uh, visa reasons. Uh, I was not really able to you know start start a company at that time. Um, but um, yeah, so at uh, at twenty five I started Keras, and uh, and after that I joined Google, and uh, I actually ended up working on Keras at Google. And that's what I've been doing since. Okay, so Keras is a big part of your life. What, it is. What is Keras? So Keras is a deep learning library in Python. Uh, it works with TensorFlow, of course. Uh, it also works with PyOrch and JAX. Uh, and it's basically this uh, Python-based uh, toolkit that enables you to very quickly uh, build any kind of deep learning model uh, you may need and uh, train it on your data. So how, how did this idea come about? How, what was sort of the, yeah, because I'm, I'm, sh- I'm sh- sure you didn't just wake up one day and be like, hey, I'm going to build a deep learning library. Like De- This must have been a, 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 a process. De- definitely not. So I was uh, aware of deep learning uh, uh, basically from 2009. Um, I uh, took note. So in, uh, in 2012, um, the uh, uh, ImageNet uh, image classification competition was won. Uh, by uh, Sutskever and, and Kruzetsky with a deep carbonet trained on GP, which was not the first time that you, you, someone had won uh, an image classification competition with a deep carbonet trained on GPU. There was uh, Dan Sirison before, a year before. Uh, but uh, my lab at University of Tokyo actually uh, ended up uh, second. And you've never heard of their entry because they were, they were second, they were right. not first. Uh, but because they, they, they were second, I was like really uh, uh, curious about this first place. Uh, uh, entry. So I, I took note that, yeah, like deep learning is, is clearly a thing. This is going somewhere. Uh, then, you know, I got, I got busy with, uh, with uh, uh, the startup stuff, uh, but I kept uh, 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 working on uh, 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 or learning about deep learning uh, in my free time. And uh, one thing I was uh, especially interested in uh, were uh, recurrent neural networks, uh, which were like, at the time, the interest in recurrent neural networks was like very, very early. Uh, the, you know, when, when I launched Keras, the deep learning community was like tiny. It was like maybe 10,000 people. Uh, so in early uh, 2014, so back when deep learning was this very, very niche academic topic, um, I started building uh, a question answering engine. It was called uh, quickanswers.io. Um, and uh, it was basically a text box where you could ask uh, a question and get, get an answer. And the tagline was... Uh, Ask any question and get a short to the point answer snippet. Um, so I, I, I launched that and it got a decent amount of traction actually. Like it was apparently interesting to a bunch of people. Um, it was it was like you know uh, 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 a, a 2014 version of something like ChatGPT or Gemini, uh, in a way. And it, what it was actually doing is it was doing a, an early version of what is now known as RAG, uh, retrieval augmented generation. So what it was actually doing is you would type in your question. It would normalize your question into a sort of standard representation. It would run a Google search query with it. Um, and from the results, it would extract a bunch of relevant uh, 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 text snippets. And then it would run an LSTM uh, text generation model uh, to sort of like try to summarize uh, uh, these text snippets into a relevant answer. So it was retrieval augmented generation, but like long before that was a thing. Uh, so in 2014, I uh, got quite a bit of traction. And in the in the process of building this thing, uh, which by the way, did, did, so it worked decently well. Uh, actually, if you if you look up like my 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 Twitter feed from that time, you you will find a bunch of examples uh, of uh, of this thing in action. Um, it worked decently well, but you know the the technology just just wasn't there at the time. Um, and in the process of building this, I got really into 
uh, uh, LSTM models. Uh, so LSTM is like a type of uh, recurrent neural network. And at, at the time, there was like no open source software for building uh, RNNs or, or LSTM models, like at all, whatever. And so I was like, uh, you know, I, I need something, so I'm just going to build my own. Uh, I started building something on the, uh, the uh, deep learning framework Theano, which was like kind of an ancestor of TensorFlow in many ways. It was roughly the same, the same architecture ideas as TensorFlow, uh, except it was, it was, you know, not, 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 maybe not as professional. Uh, it was done by like a, 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 an academic lab. And so in uh, early 2015, I decided, yeah, I have built this thing. I'm just going to open source it now. Um, and so March 2015, uh, I, I launched it. I, I picked the name uh, uh, Keras. Um, and it, it very quickly got traction. So the deep learning community was very small. Um, and because it was so small and there, there were so few people you know, doing it, uh, everyone basically took notes of it. And uh, the timing was right as well because the interest in RNNs uh, really, really started picking up steam. And uh, the, the easiest and best way to do RNNs uh, uh, back then was just Keras, right? So lots of people started adopting Keras. Uh, I joined Google. Uh, because, you know, I thought it was a, a, a nice opportunity and I, I, I really admired Google as a company. Uh, I was, I was a, a big Google fanboy, basically, at the, <laughs> back then. Uh, in, in some ways, you know, I, I still am. Uh, like about, about six months later, uh, Google actually released uh, TensorFlow. And I was like, well, uh, TensorFlow is clearly the, the, the future, so I should uh, rebase uh, Cars on top of TensorFlow. So I, I, I did that. So it, it, now, you know, it was multi backend and it could support Tiano. Or TensorFlow, um, and uh, a year later, uh, the the head of TensorFlow, uh, you know, they, 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 they noticed that, yeah, like you know, half of uh, TensorFlow users externally are just using it through Keras. Keras seems to be a big thing; it's growing fast. Uh, so he came to see me and he was like, "Hey, you know, wh why don't you join the team?" So I was like, "Yeah, it sounds, sounds good. I like working on Keras, so I, I, I would enjoy, you know, working working full time on it." Before that, that was actually not my full-time job. So my, my full-time job was actually uh, uh, doing uh, uh, computer vision research for Google Photos. Uh, so I stopped doing that. Uh, I just started doing cars full-time. I've been doing cars full-time since uh, with some research on the side. Yeah, that's basically the car story. That's, I learned so much just by listening to all of this. And as a Keras user, uh, that's great. I didn't know all the story behind it. Uh, how did you get to Keras 3? What was your take how much work was in it how how was it sure so uh so chaos 3 uh, maybe maybe we can start with like what's what's chaos 3 exactly uh chaos 3 is like a complete rewrite of keras that makes it multi backend again uh so for some time uh, chaos became tensorflow only because before like chaos was like tensorflow and Tiano, uh and cntk which was you know yet another niche uh, machine learning framework uh, but CNTK kind of died out, Tiano died out, there was just TensorFlow. Uh, so for a while, Keras was TensorFlow only. Uh, but today we are actually in a, in a multi-framework world. Like TensorFlow is very popular, but PyTorch is very popular as well. Uh, JAX is also very popular in the Gen AI space. Like many of the top uh, Gen AI players are using JAX, uh, like Cohere, uh, Anthropic, uh, Midjourney, and so on. Midjourney is, uh, is actually also using Keras 3, by the way. Um, and so I, I, I really wanted Keras users to be able to benefit from all of the ML ecosystem had to offer, not just, you know, a subset of it, which would be the, the TensorFlow subset. I kind of settled on the ID uh, at the end of uh, March last year, uh, started coding basically, you know, in the, in the last days of March, early, early days of April. Um, the first prototype was done by May. Uh, then we did like, quite a bit of uh, uh, internal alpha testing. Uh, and early July, we actually released uh, the package as Keras Core. Um, and this was, this was a big team effort. So I, I wrote maybe like 50 percent ish of the code, but uh, it, it, it was a big team effort. Like everyone on the Keras team worked on this thing. Um, so we released uh, uh, Keras Core, which was basically the public beta. Uh, and, uh, and the final version was released like three months later. Uh, so now, like, Cars 3 is uh, generally available. So it's like stable, it's production ready. It's already used in production by a bunch of, a bunch of uh, companies, including Midjourney, which is a pre pretty, nice, pretty nice anecdote. Um, and so what's really nice about Cars 3 is that you can really write code 
uh, that's back in agnostic, meaning that uh, you can pick which framework you want that code to execute with. So you can pick TensorFlow, you can pick PyDorch, you can pick JAX. And what's really powerful about this is that it makes sure, it makes sure you know, TensorFlow that you always get the best performance for your model because you can switch backend based on which backend is going to be the fastest for your particular model architecture and uh, your particular hardware. And a lot of the time it turns out to be JAX. JAX is the fastest. Uh, sometimes for some models it could be TensorFlow. For some models it could be PyTorch, right? Uh, and you, 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 you're, you're basically uh, uh, sure that you're always going to be like 20 to 30% uh, uh, faster than if you were, if you were just stuck to, to, to one backend. Um, another really nice thing is that you can start benefiting from the entire ML ecosystem. Like if you have a Keras model, so Keras 3 model, it's multi backend, you can use it with packages from the TensorFlow ecosystem, like TFJS, TFLite, and so on. Uh, you can use it with packages from the PyTorch ecosystem as well. Um, you can even use it with uh, uh, packages from the, the JAX ecosystem. And the thing is, you don't even need to be a Keras user. Like if you have a, a Keras 3 model and all your workflow is like lower level JAX code or low level PyTorch code, you can start using the Keras model as if it were a JAX function, as if it were a PyTorch module. Uh, you don't even need to care that it's, uh, that it's a Keras model, right? And this, this also uh, makes it really powerful if you want to release an open source model. Like, you know, PyTorch is about half of the market, and is about half of the market. Uh, JAX is much, much smaller. Um, and well, if you if you release a, a, a model and it's like only PyTorch uh, or only TensorFlow, then it's it's usable by half the market, right? If you release a Keras 3 model, then anyone can use it, like regardless of their framework of choice, even if they're not a Keras user. Agree. I think this uh, changes a lot because I've been in this field for a while, and there's always this, oh, did you see this model? No, no, I can't choose because it's in the other framework. No matter which you are, there's the other framework. And then there's the research that sometimes, hey, you're doing this research, I'm doing similar, but with different frameworks because we are experts in different things. I, I guess the, uh, the idea that having, how about we all work on this Keras, Keras thing and we can all share better and collaborate and move faster, I would say. So uh, this, first of all, this is a great idea. And uh, I, the community love like very much. I've seen the repository, there's lots of, uh, commits from the community, right? People yeah, are yeah. very excited. Uh, how did you see that? How, first of all, when you first did it, how did you think would the community react? And how did you see them reacting after the, the release? All right, so Chaos is really uh, uh, an open source, very community centric project. So we get lots of community contributions. We love our community. Uh, so you're, you're always welcome to contribute, and you know we will we will help you make your contribution the best possible. Uh, you know when I when I launched Keras originally, I had no idea how people would react to it. Uh, it was it was just like, hey, I made this thing, I might as well open source it, uh, type of thing. Um, and well, in in the following years, I kind of learned uh, how to manage an open source community, which is by the way, it's really something you have to learn. I don't think you can really you can really improvise it. Uh, but now I've been doing this for like nine years almost. Uh, <laughs> I got, I got, I got decent at it. Uh, I've got a lot of practice. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think, I think open source is great because, well, not only the, the software you're making can have the most impact because, uh, it's really, uh, uh usable, it's very available to anyone, but you're also helping, uh, other people who are, who, who are trying to, who are trying to learn, who are trying to make progress on their journey. Like they, they try to contribute and you kind of sort of like, guide them towards industry best practices. Uh, you also uh, help them, you know, uh, build up credentials because they can say, hey, you know, I implemented this feature in Keras, which is always, always, always nice on your resume, right? Uh, so it's, uh, it's a nice way to give back. I guess one thing that I've noticed from some of my, uh, my friends that work on this is, hey, Francois uh, left some comments on my commit and they're very excited <laughs> about, oh my God, I did this and Francois, he left a comment and it's like they are, uh, people like Sayak, for example, I guess you know Sayak Paul, he yeah, yeah. Yeah, stuff, and, and they are, it's fun because you talk to them, you see the, the sh their eyes shining, it's like, oh my God, that's so cool. And uh, that's exactly as you said, you have to 
you cannot wing it, right? You have to learn how to deal with the community the best way possible. I guess that's why it's so successful. And I'll just say that it's so nice that you're so still involved with it. You know, after nine years, it could be easy to say, okay, I built this, putting it aside, I'll move on to something else. But you're very much, like you live and breathe it and you're really yeah. dedicated to the community I'm, as well. I'm still coding, I'm still reviewing the PRs, I'm still, I'm still leaving feedback on PRs and so on. Yeah, um, it's, it's still very much my day job. Uh, it's it's great, great. And I have uh, two questions still on the topic. First of all, the main question that people might be asking is when is the new book coming? Because <laughs> right. I'm I'll currently tell you something. Working. I read both of them. They're beautiful. First of all, they're beautiful in terms of Thank colorful you. and stuff. And beautiful in terms of you... For example, they are a book that, oh, let's talk about RNNs here, CNNs in this chapter, and so on and so forth. So... Technically, you could maybe jump chapters, right? I can. I want to learn about this topic specifically. I'll jump. Uh, that your book is more than just oh, this is how to use cares. Nobody needs that. It's it's different. No, no, no. Because you can learn that in the documentation, right? That's right. That, that's, that's right. You can you can just read the docs. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so wait, so what, what the book is trying to do is not just like describe. Here's how you do this. It's trying to. Uh, help you build intuitive mental models and you know actionable mental models about how things work. And you know, as as you say, you can actually read it cover to cover because it's trying to sort of like tell a story. It's not like each chapter is independent. Like each chapter is going to be building aspects of your of your uh, intuition that's that actually uh, they're building upon uh, previous aspects that you learned in in the, in the previous chapters. And so we are trying to sort of like incrementally uh, build up uh, this, this, this mental model of, of deep learning and, and AI and Keras and all these other things. I'm, I'm also trying the, 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 the best I can to, to, to make it sort of like feel like a story, like try, try to be context rich, like insert you know, uh, notes about uh, some, some historical facts, uh, 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 not just talk about here's how like LSTM works, but talk about here's how uh, LSTMs were actually developed. Like here's what the authors were actually thinking about uh, when 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 they invented it and so on. Uh, I, th I think that's helpful. No, that's beautiful. The, uh, please continue doing that. <laughs> and but you didn't give me a date. Right. So I'm <laughs> currently working on it. Uh, it's definitely not really close to ready. Uh, my my best guess is you know probably like uh, uh, mid 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 2024 is when it's going to be out. That's amazing, perfect. Yeah, it's it's a little bit late on schedule, but you know it's no, it's that's perfect. great. So we have this uh, beautiful release that happened with the Gemma models, and they have a very beautiful integration with Keras. I'm I'm so proud to be able to collaborate on this because this was part of the when I saw the model for the first time said we cannot launch this if it's not available in carrots at the same time that's that's when people will take advantage of that's when they will use it that's giving a good user experience and i'm very glad that we could make it happen i'd like to take your uh, to hear perspective on that right so the the gemma model is uh, a new open source llm uh, by google uh it's uh, as far as benchmarks go, uh, it should be the best available uh, on the market. And in my opinion, one, one of the best features, by the way, since we are talking about the benchmarks, is that Google has really this uh, state-of-the-art uh, test set filtering mechanism. So you're quite sure that the benchmark numbers that we are putting out overfitting do not reflect a uh, training on a test set, uh, which which may not necessarily be the case for, for other, other LLMs available. Um, and um, yeah, and so we've made a Keras 3 implementation of Gemma. And uh, so of course it's Keras 3, so it's multi-backend. You can run it with JAX. Uh, it's, it's typically faster with JAX. You can run with TensorFlow, you can run with PyTorch. I'm really excited about it. I think the, the code uh, looks beautiful. The model is really good. Uh, and we've also made it you know, as useful as possible. So you can do a bunch of things with it. Uh, it uh, it's ready for uh, model parallel distributed training, for instance, if you want to uh, train from scratch or fine tune uh, your own Gemma, you can actually do it on like a cluster of GPUs, for instance, or on, on a TPU pod uh, very, very easily in just a few lines of code. 
Uh, you can also do LoRa fine tuning. So LoRa is like LoRa and adaptation. Uh, it's like a very uh, uh, memory and compute efficient way uh, to fine tune uh, uh, an LLM. Uh, and so we have a built-in LoRa API. Uh, we're making it really, really easy to enable LoRa on, a, on, a, on, a, on the Gemma model, or really, you know, any any other LLM uh, from the Cars NLP package. Uh, we're also making it easy to just save uh, the LoRa weight delta because the, these models are actually very, very large. Like the, the small model, the, the 2B model, uh, it's like uh, uh, eight gigs. Uh, that's that's pretty sizable. So if you're if you're fine tuning it, you, maybe you don't actually want to to save the entire eight gig uh, weights file. Maybe you just want to save your lower delta, which is actually on the order of like tens of megabytes. Uh, so much much smaller. And then you can reload that. And typically, when you reload, you don't, you, don't, you won't even have to re-download the original checkpoint. It's probably going to be cached. Uh, locally in your image, right? So we're we're really excited about that. We think this is this is like one of one of the best features of uh, of Cars NLP. So yeah, try that. Definitely. Uh, I really want to keep talking about large language models, and but before that, I would like to also talk a little bit about the Keras and Kago integration. Yeah, which is also something that highlights how we are powering empowering like a gigantic community. The Kago community is enormous. And bringing uh, one thing that I've been working with your team is bringing Kara's uh, starter notebooks to the competition, something that you did yourself. You, of course, you did way better than us, but we keep doing to so people can because starting a competition is hard, right? It's not like Absolutely. trivial. It's, it's very uh, let me do stuff here. No, it's not like that. So, what the idea was we give you a starter notebook using uh, explaining how Kara's work, and people can in two, learn two things. They can, oh, Kara's cool, nice. And, oh, the competition data, cool, nice, I get something. So they get two things for the same for the same notebook. And this is another thing that we've been working. Uh, what's your take on that? Right, so Kaggle is this uh, machine learning competition website. And also, you know, I think it, it plays a, a role as a sort of like machine learning social network almost. Like it's very much a community of users. It's a very large community. It's like 12, 12 million users. Like by comparison, Keras is like, Two million and a half users, um, and yeah, no, I I I love Kaggle. Like uh, first of all, like let me let me state, I, I love Kaggle. I've been a Kaggle user since 2013. Actually, won my first Kaggle competition in 2013. Oh, it was cool. a text classification competition. Wow. Um, then you know, 2013, 2014, uh, 2015, I was very active on Kaggle. Uh, in 2015, I actually made a bunch of like uh, Keras notebooks, like very early. Uh, uh, Keras uh, notebooks, and uh, this this is actually something that we are still doing to this day. Like we are releasing, you know, as as you mentioned, uh, these uh, these uh, competition starter kits uh, uh, using Keras, and and the community really really loves them because it gives you a starting point. Like you don't have to start from scratch; you can just fork this thing, uh, uh, customize it, make it your own. Uh, and so, yeah, so you mentioned uh, this Keras and Kaggle integration. So what's going on is that. Uh, Kaggle has launched uh, Kaggle Models, which is uh, basically sort of like model hub or model database uh, for, for pre-trained models of all kinds uh, in, in, in any framework you can imagine. And uh, all models from the Keras CV and Keras NP packages are on Kaggle. And so that means two things. So one is that uh, you can start using these pre-trained models uh, in an offline notebook. Like, you know, in, in Kaggle competitions, uh, many competitions are, are are in offline mode, which means that you would you would enter them by submitting a notebook, and the notebook run on the the private test data for the competition with no internet access. And there's no internet access to avoid uh, leaking out the test data, obviously, which which would be problematic. Um, and uh, well, now you can actually use uh, all these car CV cars and P models in offline mode. Uh, and and beyond that, uh, uh, people you know from the community can start. Uh, uploading their own uh, fine-tuned versions of these models uh, to Kaggle. And then anyone uh, uh, on Kaggle can start using this fine-tuned version. So it's like sort of like model uh, sharing uh, platform. So we are really excited about, about that. I agree. That's, that's uh, as you said, community, right? Communities, when they, people can share uh, back and forth, and that's that what pushes us forward. Yeah. And I guess... Uh, it's it's an interesting point in terms of the sharing, and we talk a little bit about Gemma and the large language models. And last year, and the year before, was kind of 
uh, if you're, you've been doing machine learning for a long time, I imagine you didn't see like a year like 2022 and 2023 in terms of things happening so fast mm -hmm. and not necessarily good things, but a lot of hype. That's like, uh, I guess uh, I, I liked reading your Twitter feed because you, you have some very uh, strong takes on some opinions that are like, I don't know why they had like some very weird opinions and you come and say, no, no, that doesn't make any sense. So how do you see this, first of all, this hype around the AI that started and uh, from someone that's in the field for a long time, you saw robotics, how the pace they evolve, you saw neuroscience, how the pace they evolve, all of a sudden AI became like insane, everything is happening. How do you see that going on? Yeah, so there's definitely a lot of hype uh, around LLMs. And I mean, they're, they're, they're clearly uh, badly. Wait, LLMs or AI? Uh, both, but the thing is, like lately, people have been kind of equating the two. Like people, when okay. when people say AI, what, what they really mean typically uh, is LLMs. And well, there, there, there's a ton of hype, right, which is not really justified. Uh, and people are extrapolating things that you know, as you say, uh, don't actually make any sense. But uh, at the same time, you know, that doesn't mean that LLMs uh, are useless or like they 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 are fad. Uh, they're very much not fad. They're actually a very big development, uh, and they're very useful. Uh, but when people say, you know, LLMs are uh, a prelude to AGI, artificial general intelligence, to like human law, human level intelligence, uh, well, that's definitely not uh, what they are. Uh, so LLMs, you know, they're, they're, they're transformers, they're deep learning models. So uh, uh, like we were, we were mentioning previously, like uh, deep learning models being big curves uh, that's fitted to a trained data set, this is still what LLMs are. They're like entirely based uh, on curve feeding, they're entirely based on memorization. And well, uh, as a result, um, they, they suffer from a number of problems. You know, they're they, they, they are prone to hallucinations. Uh, they're very patchy uh, generalization. Uh, they also, uh, it, it's very hard for LMs to deviate from uh, exact patterns that they've memorized, right? Like one, one example, you know, is uh, if you prompt an LLM with uh, uh, some modified version of the Monty Hall problem. I don't know if you if you're familiar with the Monty Hall problem. No, I don't. I it's don't. like okay. So let's let's talk about this then. Uh, so it's uh, it's this. Uh, you you can picture a, a game show, a TV game show, uh, where uh, you have uh, three doors, and behind one door there's a car, and you want you want to get the car, and behind the the other two doors there's a goat, and uh, the TV show host. Uh, so named Monty Hall, uh, uh, will uh, uh, so let you make a choice and you pick like some door, like let's say you pick door A. Um, and then uh, the host is going to uh, open one of the other two doors, right? And we show, oh, there, there's a goat there. Hey, do you want to change your choice or, or keep your original choice? Uh, like do you want to switch to door A or do you want to keep door, uh, switch to door B or do you want to keep door A? And well, uh, mm -hmm. it's actually um, a very interesting uh, 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 probability uh, problem and the, the the correct answer to this problem is uh, you actually get a higher chance of winning by switching your choice, which is somewhat counterintuitive uh, for many people. But roughly the the reason why uh, uh, you you actually get a better chance by by switching your choice is because uh, when Monty Hall decides to open a door, uh, they know what's behind the door and the specific door that they pick, uh, you know, that's informed by that knowledge and that action is actually providing some extra information uh, about where where the car might actually be which is why which is why now the, the, the door that was actually not opened but was also not your original door actually ends up with a higher chance of having the car behind uh, and anyway uh, if you prompt an LLM so this multi old problem description is something that an LLM has been uh, trained on it has seen in fact hundreds of instances uh, of this, this this problem with different variants and everything so if you prompt an LLM with a modified version of the Monty Hall problem where you say, hey, you know, there, there's three doors, I pick door A, and then Monty Hall uh, opens door A, and you see there's a car right there. And Monty Hall asks you, hey, do you want to switch your choice? Or do you, you keep door A? Where, again, you know, there, there's the car. Um, if you prompt the LLM with this version, it will actually tell you, uh, yes, I should, I should switch choice. And the reason why is because it doesn't actually understand the text that it's uh, reading. It's repeating something it has memorized. And in this case, because it has strongly memorized uh, the, the answer of the actual material problem, this is what it goes with. Which is so, that you should choose a choice. Either which choice you should, is should better. Change. Yeah, right. you should change. You should change choice because that's that's the official answer of the right. of the actual problem. Right. And 
Um, well, there, there's actually uh, one, one way to patch this issue, which is to patch it for this specific scenario by retraining the LLM uh, on modified scenarios of the multiple problem. But then, then the thing is that you have to repeat this sort of like one-time patch for every other problem. And the only way to, to patch that is to actually retrain the LLM via RLHF uh, uh, specifically on, on, this, on this problem. So they cannot really deviate from patterns that they've memorized. Uh, and they have very, very patchy generalization. And they cannot handle uh, any sort of like task or scenario that they're not uh, familiar with, that they are, they've not been trained on. So the way I think about LLMs is LLMs are basically, so they, they, they are stores of knowledge, uh, information, but they're also stores of uh, programs. Uh, they, they've seen sort of like every uh, pattern uh, you could see uh, on the internet and they've stored them in the form of uh, vector programs. Um, and they can even interpolate between different programs. And when you query an LLM, what you're actually doing is that you're retrieving uh, a program from, from this latent program space and running it on your data. Like for instance, if you, if you ask, write a poem in the style of Baudelaire or something. Uh, well, write a poem in the style of is like a program that's somewhere out there in the latent space. And it's, it's an interpolative program, by the way, which is why if you change the formulation of the prompt a little bit, uh, you will get a, 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 a similar close point in program space. It's not exactly the same, which, by the way, is the origin of prompt engineering. Like your first question formulation is probably not the best program coordinate for what you're trying to do. And so if you want to find the best program coordinate, you have to uh, search a little bit of a program space. Right, that's that's what prompt engineering is, and well, this this is all extremely useful. Like being able to store uh, these like millions of potentially useful uh, programs, being able to reply them, being able to interpolate between them. This is tremendously useful. Uh, you can you can use that to uh, uh, automate or, or enhance uh, uh, many many different tasks uh, across any number of industries. But this is not. Uh, the way intelligence works. Like humans are not just sponges uh, of, of data and programs that are completely unable to deviate from what they've memorized. Uh, humans actually have general intelligence and general intelligence is very much the ability to adapt, the ability to make sense to situations you've not uh, been through before, right? So uh, I don't know if you know Jean Piaget, it's like the, the father of uh, 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 development of psychology and he, he had He's actually got the seven uh, stages yeah yeah exactly uh, that's that's what he's, he's really known for like the stages of cognitive development and he had uh, a very uh, well phrased i think quote about this he said uh, intelligence is what you use uh, when you don't know what to do it's like it's what you use hmm. when you're experiencing something that you've not been prepared for right so like your past experience has not prepared you for this moment uh, the prior knowledge that you're born with uh, like narratives from evolution, basically, I also not prepared you uh, for this moment. And so that's when you have to use intelligence. And LLMs have basically no intelligence. What they have is memorization. And as long as you're operating within their training data distribution, so meaning that you're trying to solve a task which has a solution uh, which has been memorized by the LLM and its training data, then the LLM can do it. All you have to do is find the right prompt, which is the right program coordinate in this sort of like program space, a sea of different programs, the vector programs. Uh, so you, you, you find that prompt and, and, and now, you, and now you, have, uh, you have automated the task. You can just reapply the program on your data. What they cannot do in, is synthesize new programs on the fly to adapt to something they've not seen before. Uh, they, they basically, and, and this is, by the way, this is independent of task complexity. If you ask an, uh, an LLM to do something that they are not familiar with, even if it's a really, really trivial problem, uh, they are not going to be able to do it. And you, you, you see this, uh, for instance, uh, on the ARC challenge. So the ARC challenge is sort of like uh, IQ test uh, for machines uh, that are released in, uh, in 2019. So before the rise of LLMs, right? I was releasing this um, as a way to test and, and illustrate uh, uh, my definition of intelligence. And my definition of intelligence is basically, you know, it's exactly what I, what I just told you, that intelligence is about the ability to adapt, uh, which basically means it's about the ability to uh, efficiently acquire new skills at tasks that you were not prepared for, right? that you were not explicitly trained to do. 
So how efficiently can you pick up a new scale? Well, in, in, in the case of LLMs, uh, uh, it turns out the only way uh, you can get them to pick up new scales uh, is by, is by fine-tuning. And fine-tuning, as it turns out, is, is tremendously inefficient. So LLMs are not very intelligent. I would say they have non-zero intelligence, and this is actually reflected in the fact that they score non-zero uh, on the ARC test, uh, but they have very, very, very low uh, intelligence. And so ARC is, is pretty interesting because it's a set of like a uh, uh, few shots, sort of like puzzles, uh, kind of IQ test like. And well, any human can, can, can solve like, you know, well, well over 80% of these puzzles. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, for uh, AI systems and, and deep learning models and LLMs in particular, uh, it's completely out of reach. Like the state of the art today is 31%, which is not, not based on LLMs. Um, and if you take an LLM like Gemini or ChatGPT4, um, and you just prompt it to solve these puzzles, it will it will score like bet between five and ten percent typically, um, and that and none of these puzzles uh, are, is is really difficult. Like you you can you can give them to a, a five year old and they, they will do a great job actually. And the reason why is because the five year old actually has general intelligence. They can see something they've never seen before and make sense of it, right? And um, each puzzle is uh, novel to some extent. Like it's probably not similar to anything you could see uh, on the internet. Um, but anyway, yeah, this is really interesting. It's like these are very, very simple pattern-based uh, reasoning puzzles. LLMs can absolutely not solve them. They cannot solve them because they, there's no direct match between these puzzles and something they've memorized. But the five-year-old can actually solve them because, because they have intelligence, because they can adapt, right? Do you think that the transformers architecture, which is the base of most of it. It might not be the solution, it might be in a local maxima, let's say like that, for the AGI search, let's say like that. Yeah, so I mean, Transformers have been, have been tremendously successful and I don't think there's zero overlap between Transformers and the brain. Um, if, you, if you look closely at what Transformers actually do and, and why they work, uh, I think there's an analogy between uh, learning and transformers and Hebbian learning in the brain. And the base of the analogy is that transformers via uh, the self-attention mechanism, uh, they have this ability to uh, embed together, like spatially together, uh, concepts, things, which in the case of a transformer, it's like tokens. So embed together tokens that are semantically uh, similar, uh, which uh, is basically a proxy. So one proxy you can use for, for semantic similarities when they when they co-occur together. Um, and um, the way the way self-attention achieves this is because um, in self-attention, you're, you're going to be looking at token embeddings, you're going to be computing a dot product uh, between them, and that gives you a similarity score between, between these two points. And uh, self-attention will have this tendency to uh, pull closer together uh, token embeddings that, are, that already have a higher dot product. And so this, this basically implements again learning very much. And I do believe that um, there is a, a decent analogy between that sort of learning and what happens in a, a human sort of like passive perception. Everything that you learn passively, like if you look, if you look at young kids uh, 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 learning, well, it's pretty clear that they, they do some amount of this sort of like passive unsupervised learning, like predicting the next sensory motor frame uh, type of thing, which is which is basically what what transformers are doing, um, but uh, most learning in humans is not that right. It's not it's not it's not passive. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna learn the next instrument frame. It's actually active learning. It's much higher level learning. It's causal learning, um, and it's like, let's do, let me try this and figure out how to exactly. It's like you you learn you learn via play. You learn actively. Uh, by actually experimenting, by trying things out, seeing what happens, and then learning from it, and using that learning to inform the next experiment, just just like you would do uh, as a scientist, actually, like young children are actually behaving exactly like like scientists, and and they're just doing it like intuitively. Um, and I mean, you see this especially, for instance, in the way in the way kids uh, learn language, right? Like. Uh, a two-year-old doesn't learn to speak by predicting the next token, like passively, based on what they've heard. It's not what happens. Uh, for, for a two-year-old, language is, uh, first, first and foremost, it's an action. It's an act. Like they're using words as a way to influence their surroundings. 
like the, the same way you would use your, your hands and your arms to reach things. Uh, it's, it's a way to reach things. Uh, that's, that's what language is. And kids, you know, you, you, you can tell they're not just learning the next token because they, they only arrive at uh, grammatical correctness very, very late. They start out with um, the important bits of a sentence in place like, you know, subject, object type of thing. And everyone, everything else is missing. So they get the sort of like zoomed out macrostructure right long before they actually get the next token thing. They are using language, they are interacting with language, again, as a sort of like motor modality, the same way, the same way you would use your hands, for instance. I wanted to come back to this concept of hype has come from it also reaching sort of mainstream too. Um, and so your answer explains that we're really far, very, very far from AGI and that ultimately LLMs and the current state of AI and machine learning is very much in a beginner stage. So it doesn't sound like you're very worried about the future. No, I'm not. I know I know. there's a lot of um, talk of existential risk right. uh, created by AI. I'm definitely not worried about that, at least, you know, ba based on the current technology. Like LLMs are not going to magically morph into... Uh, uh, autonomous agents with superhuman capabilities. Um, LLMs, again, they're like big curves fitted uh, on, on human-generated data. They are very much uh, limited to that training data. They're, they can only operate within their training data distribution. So they're, they're, there's no real re need to, to like build a prison around around this type of AI because it's already in a prison. It's, it's in prison by the, by the latent manifold. No, I'm, I'm not worried about existential risk for sure. I mean, that's like pure, pure science fiction. That said, you know, I do believe there, are, there, there may be, you know, some concerns around the deployment of AI at scale, uh, for sure, like its impact on, on culture, uh, maybe as well its impact on, on employment. Like I don't believe AI is going to cause mass unemployment, but it will definitely affect uh, specific, uh, 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 specific jobs. Uh, uh, in aggregate, you know, the, 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 the employment market will be fine, but some, some professions will be affected for sure. Of course, uh, I don't see it as an existential threat the same. Uh, of course, LLMs are very useful, but I guess the hype that was created around them make them seem like almost magical and, and it's not like it. It's like, it's a super fancy auto complete with a lot of work, but it's yeah. As was said, it's still has its flaws. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm not I'm not a huge fan of the autocomplete uh, metaphor, because so we we all have already a mental model for what autocomplete is because it's on on our phones, uh, but I don't think that's really the mental model that's right uh, to think about to, to think about LLMs. Uh, I think probably the best mental model is you can think of it uh, you can think of of, an, of an LLM as a database of programs. And of course, it's not the kind of programs that, you, that you're that used to, like Python and everything. They're vector programs. And they're actually, they're actually continuous. You can actually interpolate between them. Uh, but it's, it's very much like a database of memorized programs. Uh, I think that's actually the, the more constructive, the more uh, explanatory mental model for LLMs. Uh, and well, you know, that, that's, that's tremendously useful. You can build a ton of really uh, useful applications uh, uh, on top of that, but that is not uh, intelligence, right? That is not autonomy. That is not reasoning. Um, that is in fact not very much. That is just memorization. Uh, well, memorization is tremendously useful, but uh, again, it's not. It's not some kind of magical free lunch that will give rise to superhuman uh, uh, autonomous AIs. And really, you know, if you're talking about uh, human level AI and what it would take to get there, we are very, very far from it. You know, as, as I mentioned, I see intelligence as um, the efficiency with which you can pick up new skills. And LLMs uh, would score non-zero, but extremely, extremely low uh, on that scale, right? And in, in general, you know, we, we are making baby steps uh, uh, along the lines of being able to do, to do few short learning, being able to like synthesize uh, new programs to adapt to novel situations on the fly. Uh, we are very, very far from anything that would be human level. Doesn't mean that we are not going to get there in, uh, in in the foreseeable future. Uh, we will eventually get there. It's very, it's very hard to tell, you know, when exactly and what what form this will take. Uh, but we are not we are not getting there, you know, next year or in two years. 
Uh, that's very, very implausible. And when we do get there, well, you know, LLMs may be part of the solution, uh, but they, they, they are not going to be uh, the most essential part in the same way that I don't think like the, 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 the visual cortex or the auditory cortex, they, they are not like the most essential thing about uh, the way human intelligence works. Thank you so much for being with us today and for taking the time. This was a fascinating conversation and you shared so much and we're very, very grateful for this. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. If you would like to learn more about our conversation or our guests, check out the links below. Please subscribe and if you're feeling extra generous, give us a five-star rating. We would love, love to hear from you. So leave us a comment. We'll read everyone. Until next time, thank you for listening.